Welcome to the Ladies Who Leverage podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Charles Collins, and I know that you know we're on hiatus for the summer, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't get amazing content. So I'm going to share with you some interviews I did with some of the women in Ladies Who Leverage. Um, We had an amazing series called What's the Tea during Women's History Month, where we talked about things from self-care to women in work to empowerment and also about relationships. So I'm going to share those with you so that you have some amazing new content. You're going to find that the ladies had some great strategies and tips and tactics for navigating the world as women. So I hope you enjoy this series. And again, if you want to know more about Ladies Who Leverage, we are a global network of diverse women who collab source to leverage our influence, to increase our income and create impact so we can live life unapologetically AF. You can always go to ladieswholeverage.com to learn more or join us in our Facebook group. So for now, I want you to enjoy this series. It was our What's the T series. I want you to enjoy that. We talked about self-care. We talked about women in work. We talked about empowerment and we talked about relationships. And as always, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss an episode. And please leave a review and share it with your network. Bye for now. Welcome to our episode of What's the Tea? Real women having real conversations. This is sponsored by Ladies Who Leverage. Ladies Who Leverage is a global women's community that empowers women to leverage their expertise, resources, and relationships to build their business, brand, and badassery. I'm your moderator, Kelly Charles Collins. I'm also the CEO and founder of Ladies Who Leverage. And I am a retired attorney who companies now hire to keep them on the right side of the next hashtag movement. And I do that by training their employees and leaders on unconscious bias, bystander intervention, and workplace investigations, also on courageous conversations. And today we're going to have one of those types of courageous conversations around women and work, 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 work. Because I love Rihanna, so of course I had to <laughs> had to change the title up a little bit. And I'm also the host of the Ladies Who Leverage podcast. So please make sure that you go click and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. So today we have an amazing panel of women. They are all members of Ladies Who Leverage, and we wanted to celebrate Women's History Month and talk about topics that impact women both professionally and personally. So as we call on them, I will introduce each of them to you so you know how badass these women really are. And I'm telling you, these are some badass women. And these are just like a little microcosm of all of the badass women that we have in Ladies Who Leverage. So today we're gonna talk about, I said work, 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 work. If you're joining us on Facebook, put comments, we'll answer. If you have questions, put them in the chat and we will, or in the comment box, whatever you wanna call it, and we'll answer those. Or if you have a comment, we'll read them. If you're joining us live on our webinar, then please type, it's better if you type it in the Q&A so that we can actually see the questions. If you type it in the chat, we will go in there and try to figure it out. But in case that just keeps going crazy, it's better for you to put it in the Q&A. So, Again, we're going to be talking about work, 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 work. So if you have any questions about, you know, how women interact in the workplace, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So if y'all have watched the news, then you know that there's like this little bit of a kerfuffle going on between Sharon Osbourne and Cheryl Underwood on the talk right? There was the, the this whole discussion around some comments that were made by Piers Morgan and Sharon Osbourne's um, agree, not agreement with him, but just taking up for her friend, right? She's good friends with Piers Morgan and she was taking up for her friend. And they had a discussion yesterday on the show around that issue. And what I want to throw out to the panel, and I'm curious about the content of what they were talking about. What struck me was the interaction that they were having. So I want you all to talk to me about that. And, you know, have you encountered that in the workplace? And if you have, how would how would you have dealt with it yesterday, right? Whether hopefully constructively, but how would you have dealt with it? Or how have you dealt with that personally in your own right? And I'm going to go first to Tanya Morris. And the reason I'm going to Tanya is because Tanya 
is a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant. She's also an employee resource group and multi-generation keynote speaker and trainer. So this is right up your alley, Tanya, because I, for me, it felt very microaggressive, it did. <laughs> right, to say the least. So what were your thoughts around that? Well, I definitely did not like the tone. The tone and the tenor would have and I'm going to keep it real with it, probably set me off, right? Because that's the the proof of microaggression, how it goes on in the workplace and it's acceptable. And Sharon didn't think she was doing anything wrong and she was really pushing the buttons. And I think today's workplace, we're not taking that anymore. And typically, if we would have went in, we would have been an angry black woman. So I thought Sharon Underwood had to compose herself. But I really think that's an example of what goes on in the workplace. We cannot have, we should, but we're not having uncomfortable conversations. And we have to be comfortable with those uncomfortable conversations. And the point was the microaggression was played out. Mm -hmm. And so we say microaggression. So what does microaggression mean, Tanya? Because well, some you people know, may not know. Uh, and I, you're, you're absolutely right. So it's it's language for me is, you know, what you say, how you say it, the implication of it. And I think sometime, I think she was a, a little, it was okay for her to be aggr aggressive, you know, what pushing her to the, the, uh, the points, if you will. But if she, uh, Karen, not Sharon, but if Cheryl would have went another way, she would have been known as angry. So I think sometimes it's all about how you position the words and you are, um, it's almost like it was demeaning, if you will. Yeah. So Becca, I'm gonna bring you in on this conversation. So Rebecca Larson, we love Becca. So Becca is breaking the mold, y'all, in California real estate law. She is passionate about asset protection for homeowners and investors throughout the state. And she's an attorney who's licensed in California, Virginia, and DC. And she's now a TikTok star. So if y'all want to see videos about, you know, what's going on in California and the law, I think you need to check Becca out on TikTok. But Becca, what did you think? So as a white woman, and, and obviously, elephant in the room, you're the sole white woman on our panel today, but we love you. And you know, you're not the sole white woman in, in Ladies Who Leverage. Yeah. But what did, what was your feeling when you saw that? Um, it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing that Sharon felt that she had the ability to speak to Cheryl that way. Um, it was embarrassing that as a white woman, she was willing to stand by a white man, disparage, a, not a, it doesn't matter that Meghan Markle is a black woman, that she was willing to stand by a man, disparage a woman. The fact that it was a black woman made it that much more embarrassing. Um, but the fact that she was also speaking to her coworker and colleague that way, you know, like I understand that it's good for television to create the conflict, but that conversation could have been done in a more productive way that actually fosters the type of conversations that we need to be having rather than perpetuating this garbage type of conversation. Yeah. And I, you know, I think what we forget sometimes, I, I'm glad that you raised the issue about television, because I think we forget sometimes when we see them on TV and they're acting in that manner, that that's somebody's workplace, right? So what was happening on TV was Cheryl's workplace, was Sharon's workplace. It wasn't that they're just doing some movie or they were doing whatever. And even if it was a movie, that's their workplace. And I think we forget that sometimes. And so we we tend to kind of let things go. Diani, I know that you have a little bit, maybe a different take on this. So I want to bring you in. But first, I got to tell you about Diani. Tell you these women are amazing. So Diani Winter Funday is an attorney. She is a legal rebel entrepreneur and a girl boss, right? You can see she's a girl boss. She is a manage, managing attorney and founder and founding partner of Winter Law Practice. We also affectionately call her the mayor of Clubhouse. So if you're on Clubhouse, go check her out in the Immigration Law Academy. She knows everything and everybody on Clubhouse knows Diani. So Diani, what is your take on, on what happened with um, Cheryl and Sharon? Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. So I have somewhat of a different opinion, right? Because I think Sharon is entitled to her opinion, right? And I know I have to tread carefully because I'm because I'm a black woman. So if I even say Pierce is entitled to his opinion, people are going to say, "Oh my God, she's taking the side of Pierce." And I almost have to say it's it's free speech, right? 
Pierce can say what he wants. Is is Pierce Morgan a racist? Yeah, I agree that he is. But I also loved that Becca pointed out it's television. It makes good TV, which is why we're talking about the, the whole confrontation between Cheryl and Sharon. In my personal opinion, we also have to take culture into account. Sharon Osborne is a Brit. She speaks like one. She's aggressive. She's a she's a She's a businesswoman, right? If we know Sharon, Sharon is going to spit it to you. And I think that's what was happening. And I, I think Cheryl could have responded in like, right? But we know as Black women, when we're confronted with these circumstances in the workplace, you know, we tend to either fold up or shy away or, or think about our actions. How will, will I be branded the angry Black woman? So I think Cheryl chose to respond differently. And Sharon Osborne, being the Brit that she is, I, I, the British bulldog of a woman that she is, responded in, in, in like. So I really do have a different opinion about the, the conversation. And um, I'm looking forward to hear what the other women have to say. This is Diani. I am done speaking. Girl, we're not in Clubhouse. I know, girl. <laughs> See, I told y'all she's the mayor of Clubhouse. See, she can't she can't get it out of her. You could take the girl out of Clubhouse, but you can't take the Clubhouse out of the girl. And Deanna, you know, I don't really think that you have a different a, a different take. Because as I said, I don't care. If, for me, it's not about the content of the conversation. What I was watching was the behavior and the interaction. And what I know from being an employment lawyer of how those things show up every single day and you know how it struck me donna i want to hear your take on this but let me introduce you to miss donna st louis so donna is st louis is my dear friend and she's also my coach right but donna works with winning entrepreneurs to be champion entrepreneurs she is one of the leading experts in the country for sales and market attraction training don't get it twisted see all those big boys out there no donna <laughs> <laughs> From homeless, being homeless, to selling a $250 million tech company, Donna also leverages her expertise to coach clients to make $250,000 in five days using mansion retreats. That's badass. So D Donna, welcome. And what is your take on all of this? Um. So first of all, I'm probably... I'm probably closer to where Diani is than anyone else, but now I'm going to take it one step further. Um, what makes us think that he's a racist and not prejudiced? Don't answer that yet. That's number one, because people's prejudgment show up as racism all the time. And I don't really have a label for it. I can label, I cannot label him, but I can label my response, my reaction. I didn't like it. But with that said, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. And as a woman, as a black Italian and Jamaican woman who works with a multitude of white males in very powerful position, I'm going to say this. I cannot wait until I can get my sisters to stop worrying about what everybody thinks because I show up like this all the time and they pay me a lot. And I don't mean like this, like this was coming out of my mouth all the time and they pay me a lot of money to do it, to be transparent, to hold their feet to the fire, to tell them when they're wrong. I'm not disrespectful, but I am very direct. I cannot wait until we stop worrying that people gonna label us as. I could give a damn about somebody's label. But I don't, I, about, I, don't think, I, I don't think it's about, I don't think, so I don't think it's about worrying about the label, right? So most of, so you're an entrepreneur, right? You run your business. In the workplace, though, where you are an employee, that's a whole different ball game. Believe me, if 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 Cheryl Underwood, right, was in charge of CBS, Cheryl Underwood would not have been as calm as she was, right? Cheryl Underwood understands, and so what we need to do, what we need, is for our workplaces to be a space where we don't ever have to worry about that because we know that if we, if somebody was to aggress us in some way that we could respond in kind or respond in, in what we feel to be appropriate. So it's not even really so much about us changing our mind, but about workplaces changing so that we don't have to feel that we have to make others feel comfortable. So I'm gonna move on from this topic, go ahead. 
I was going to say, but it's not. So listen, in my opinion, and again, I've had this mouth for many, 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 many years, even when I worked in somebody else's job, it's not going to change until we start bringing it to the workplace. It's just like when sisters started wearing, stop, stop, permanent hair, so to speak, and started wearing they natural, right? It's not going to change. Not that perm is bad. I'm just saying it's not going to change until we start showing up and changing it because staying silent and behaving Listen, if my grandma would have behaved, I wouldn't be here. That's all I'm saying. True. But I also understand time and place, right? And so we're making changes, right? Um, (laughs) No, I know. We know you don't know time and place, but we're making changes. And, but I just wanted to, I wanted to bring that, not to create um, controversy, even though I don't care about creating controversy, but I wanted to have the conversation because I wanted people to look beyond what was being said and how the behavior, because that is the behavior that we see a lot of times. Sometimes it's between men and women, right? So we're talking about women in work. A lot of times we see it between men and women. Sometimes we just see it between women and women, regardless of the race. But we also do see it a lot happening between black women and white women in our workplaces. So I wanted to bring that up. So let's talk about y'all and women and work. So Miss Tangela Irby, you are an educator. So let me talk to you a little bit. So Tangela, for over 25 years, Tangela Irby has worked as an educator in the state of Connecticut. She has served students of all ages, pre-K to adults, in various roles, including teacher, building administrator, and curriculum supervisor. She currently serves as an adjunct at Sacred Hearts University Farrington College of Education and is a coach and trainer for the Yale. Yeah, that one, Yale. Yeah, that one. Yale Center of Emotional Intelligence. Most recently, she has added author to her title, publishing two children's books and two journals. And I want to talk to you, um, Tange, about being a an educator and being a woman in, because some of us are entrepreneurs, right, on this stage, and others like you are entrepreneurs, as I call them. You're still working, but you have entrepreneurial ventures. What is it, how, how does that work for you in terms of like split, splitting time and being able to serve both of those interests? Well, I have to say it is one of my biggest struggles being new to this, because typically if you have a nine to five, you know, you work your hours and you may have some things to do at night, et cetera. Um, but it started off with me doing my work for my nine to five during the day, right? And then having to find time and actually working with things for my book until maybe nine at night. And so now that things are transitioning a little bit more for me, I'm really, I still struggle with that a lot. So I find myself, for example, saying that at a certain time at night, that's it, wherever I am, I'm going to stop right there. Um, My calendar, my um, alarm clock, those are my friends. I have to write every single thing down because if I don't, I won't get to it. I have to block out time. This is the time of day that I'm going to work on the book, for example, whether it's promoting the book, whether it's marketing the book, whether it's invoicing people for the book. um, That's really the only way that I'm able to to manage that. And then when it comes to, for example, whether it's work Sacred Heart, if I'm doing lesson plans, if I'm studying for the different modules for the work that I'm doing at Yale, everything is blocked out into my calendar. And I actually met with a coach that I'm working with in terms of the business. And what he recommended was find time to just block in time to take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Do the things that you need to do. So it really is, it's a game of uh, right now is calendar magic for me. You know, yeah. um, if I don't write it down, it just, I keep thinking about it over and over and over again. So I have to write it down just as a way of self-care for myself. Everything is written on my calendar. So that's yeah. the biggest way that I'm able to juggle it all. And Teresa, you also work full time. So I want to pull you into this conversation. So let me tell you a little bit about Ms. Teresa Green. She is a claims litigation manager who has worked for a major insurance company for 24 years. She's also a business owner. She is a paparazzi jewelry consultant. And her background and expertise is in leadership, coaching, and management. So Teresa, similar to, to Tangie, how how are you juggling, you know, working full time and also being a business owner? So I would tell you, um, before I didn't have a calendar. 
So each year what I started doing, and I actually have it, I'm going to share it with you guys, but I have a planner. This is my planner. Okay. So I write everything down. So I would tell you the first year of me doing paparazzi, I struggled with it because my nine to five is very demanding. And I was working 10 to 12 hour days and I wasn't really putting a lot in my business, but um, got some advice from a good friend. And she says, you have to write it down, make time, put it down. We get 24 hours. Like I was writing it down from, you know, from eight to whatever I'm doing. Um, and then I have to, you know, like Tangela said, you're working in your business going live. I go live to sell my jewelry. I do vending events. I had to physically write it down. Um, I still struggle with it sometimes, but I learned to take time for me. That was another thing. I'm doing so much for everybody else, but I try to build in that me time to take care of me. Yeah. And last week you talked about self-care. And so we see that it's, it goes through everything, right? We have to make sure that we take care of themselves. And that's interesting that both of you said that what's saving you is your calendar, right? Blocking out the time to do it. And now Tanya is actually a full-time, um, Tanya works full-time, but Tanya, and we're, we're pulling her, pulling her maybe to the entrepreneurial side, but not just yet. But let me tell you about Tanya. Tanya is my very, very dear friend. So Tanya, and I've known Tanya for 25 years, 24 years, um, when we started out as baby lawyers um, together. So I've known Tanya forever. She is a dedicated mother, a passionate juvenile defense attorney, anything juvenile defense, she's your girl. And she's an aspiring author, so we're trying to pull her and nudge her to get this book done so she can work on her book series, which um, is for juveniles. And so we're very excited that she's embarking on that journey. So Tanya, like in this group of, you know, you have us full entrepreneurs, you have all the, the intrapreneurs, and then you're here. What is different for you about um, being full time and then trying to be this aspiring author, how are you dealing with that? Well, actually, I mean, I think there's another job that you haven't mentioned, um, and that is being a mom. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. full-time job in <laughs> yeah. and of itself, and especially now um, in this era of COVID, I've been working from home since March of last year. And I will say my days are way longer um, and definitely, I guess one of the things for me that has saved me are my frequent trips <laughs> to the beach, um, and working out at the gym. So for me, um, and, and FYI, I was an entrepreneur. I had my own business That's true. prior to, um, my current position as supervising attorney at the Office of Regional Counsel. So I am familiar with what it's like to be a business owner, having people work for you. Um, quite frankly, also being in a supervisory position, um, it's almost like my own business because I have a boss who trusts me to take care of the division and doesn't micromanage. and. You know, I listened to the first topic, you know, that you guys brought up, which I didn't see um, with Cheryl. Um, and I know in my current environment, I would be able to say and do whatever and have his support. So, um, you know, life for me, um, full time attorney, full time attorney working for someone else, but also full time mom. It's nonstop. Yeah. I'll be honest. Um, I was late now for this meeting because it never stops. And especially with the kind of work that I do, I represent children. I consider them my children. So I actually eat, sleep. I think about them all the time and whatever they're going through. So emotionally and mentally, I am always working. Yeah. And I was going to ask you a question about being a mom. And this, I want to ask you and Becca this question, because so many women who have small children or all of us who've had children and had to go to work. I want to know, have you ever experienced mom guilt? Well, let's say this. Um, I, um, the answer for me, the short answer is no. 
because thankfully I work for individuals and I actually appear in front of a judge who understands putting your family first. And so if there's anything going on with my child, I am always present and they will understand. So no, I do not experience that. What about you, Becca? Because I know that you have a little girl. Um, you all have the youngest chill. Yeah, the youngest children here. So Becca, have you experienced mom guilt? I wanted to answer the question with, is the sky blue? Yeah. <laughs> um, so my daughter's five and a half and in kindergarten. But when I, I was a partner in a law firm before I moved to California and I announced to my partners who were all older male partners, um, I'm going to be taking some time off, was kind of ambiguous about it. And they said, oh, are you going to California? My husband was deployed at the time. And I said, no, we're having a baby. And they, you know, after the collective jaw drop, they're like, well, what are you going to do with it? And I was like, well, it's a baby, not an it, but you know, I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring the baby here because I was, there's no childcare. There's no maternity leave. Like there's just nothing in place. So I always, I felt guilty having to go back to work. I was back in the office. I was doing work the day after she was born in the hospital and back in the office at, she was three weeks old. I'm, I was back in the office and I had her strapped to me 24 seven because I had to work 24 seven, you know, and that, that was it. And it was exhausting and frustrating. And I wasn't doing it alone. Like we had support, you know, from family members, but um, yeah, the guilt is real. Like for me, it was because I felt like I can't give her everything that I wish I could give her. The other part of it is feeling guilty about wanting to give myself time for myself. Like I, for a long, and it took me a long time to get there uh, where I was able to say, I'm doing this for me. I need to take time for myself. Otherwise I'm going to lose it. Yeah. And, and I was going to, you know, as far as like, have you gotten past the guilt, like, or through the guilt, or is it still there? Does it still linger? It still lingers. It's not quite as bad. Um, being in a position where I own my own firm now and it's just me and I don't, you know, that's given me a lot of ability to be more flexible. Um, she said to me the other day, she goes, mom, I want to stay home. And I said, I can't stay. We can't stay home today. I said, let's go look at the calendar. And I live by my calendar too. I'll echo all of you that are saying that you live by your calendar. I live by my calendar. Otherwise it, it just wouldn't happen. So we went and she looked at my calendar and she says, what about this day? And it's like next Wednesday or Wednesday after. And I said, good, I'm taking the whole day off. You're going to do your school and we're going to have a mom day. Like that, I don't feel guilty about at all. And I'm really excited to be able to say, I get to check out out of office, not doing it. I get to devote all of my time to my daughter for the entire day because that's what she needs. Yeah. That's so awesome. And yeah. Diani, I know that you um, had your child when you were younger. So did you experience any type of um, mom guilt when you were going about going off to school and then going to get your law degree and really pursuing your profession? Did you have any guilt around that? All right, so, so confession, um, mom guilt, I think is a new term of art. Um, I, I got pregnant first at 15 and then again at 23. So by the time I got to law school at 27, my Danny was 11, Damani was four, right? So I didn't understand the guilt until later on, right? When they got older and I realized how absent I was. So even if I was physically present in the home, I was absent. Um, and so now I think I overcompensate at times, right? Mm -hmm. If my daughter is in New York and she has anything going on, anything going on, I am on the next flight because I feel like I've missed out on some things. I remember at night studying and turning the dishwasher on and telling two little kids, you better not open your mouth because I I have to write a brief or I have to outline and, and then being just sitting there like, and, and, you know, I get super emotional now when I look back, I'm like, was this child abuse? I don't, I don't know. Um, 
and, and I remember even taking them to law school with me and having them sit outside the classroom for three hour sessions until of course I, I was reported to Child Protective Services. So I, I didn't understand the term mom guilt. I just thought this is something I had to do. But now in present, um, I still go to visit my, my son on campus, which is weird. All his friends love me because I'll show up with jerk chicken, curry chicken, <laughs> And I fly on airlines and I think it's my therapy, Kelly. I, I really do think yeah. it's my way of saying I was absent and my kids will tell you how many times they were forgotten at events. Like I would li literally, I didn't have a calendar back then. And I'm, I'm talking about 15, 16, 17 years ago. I would forget to pick them up. I dropped them off at libraries that were closed because mm -hmm. I couldn't afford a childcare. So I would drop them off at the library, dash to school. And one Saturday, the library was closed and they stood in front of the library for like three hours waiting for me to finish class before cell phones. So do I have, I didn't have mom guilt then, but I do think in hindsight now I do a lot of things out of not being, being present um, back then. Yeah. Don, I know that you have two adult boys, um, well, men, two adult men. Um, did you ever experience any type of mom guilt? And if so, how did you work through that? Um, so no, but I'm feeling like I should. So I'm going to look back and <laughs> I really didn't because for two reasons. Um, number one, when I started my business intelligence company, it was not brick and mortar. We were doing virtual before virtual was cool, right? Um, so what actually was interesting is after I sold my company, my my sons were 20 and 17. So basically graduating from high school and I decided that I was going to get a job. And so I went and got a job and my 17 was, my 17 year old was like, where are you going? Like they, were, they had never, act, they were used to me working from home. Mm -hmm. They had always been used to me working from home. And I never considered myself an at-home mom because I was in my office. And so, yeah, when they were like 17 and 20, he was like, what, what do you mean you're going, going to work? You work up there. And I'm like, no, no, there's work in offices outside of the house. <laughs> so, yeah. so I didn't really, I didn't really have it because I was pretty much because I was always there with them. And um, I made my, my schedule kind of revolved around whatever the things that I wanted to do. And it was, and quite honestly, I didn't set out and do it purposefully. So I kind of got lucky. I'll have to call them and say, hey, was I bad? And then then maybe I'll have some guilt. I have any well, no, I, I mean, nobody wants you to have guilt, but but that's a real thing, right? There are a lot of women that we know who be, who have children and you know going to work makes them feel guilty. Sometimes it's other people making them feel guilty, right? right. How could you they, leave I your think, children? I um, think they really, you really have to give, give yourself a break because here's the thing. You did the best you could with what you had and what you knew how to do. It wasn't like you, like, I don't think anybody on this panel was out there talking about, I'm gonna purposely leave or purposely do anything, right? So, and here's the thing. Quite honestly, when I grew up, we was broke as all get out. I didn't know, I didn't actually know we were poor until I got way older. I was like, oh, we were really broke, right? So I didn't even know we were broke, but I was happy and everything was fine. And so, and, and I think it toughened me up. So not having, um, struggling a little bit and all that other stuff, well, that's the, the thing that keeps me hungry and keeps me driven today. And so, I think as long as you did the best you could with what you had, there is nothing for you to give, feel guilty about. And y'all know how I feel about other people's opinions. So what other people think doesn't even matter. It is matters. What, what you we know that, right? And ladies who leverage what other people think about you is what? Is not your business. <laughs> not your business. Not your business. So I want to go back to something that Tanya brought up, though, when she was talking about where we are now in terms of COVID. Because there have been some boundary extending, <laughs> right? Because of COVID. How has that impacted you um, with your work and your family life in terms of like work and home are now the same thing, right? They're the same place. So I'm gonna bring Teresa in on that one. And then um, Teresa, what, do you, what have you felt in terms of these boundaries expanding or maybe they haven't for you? 
I feel like I am doing way more work since I've been home. I feel like I would say I've been home now since March of last year, and I feel like I am doing way more work. So after the first three months, I had to kind of like separate some things. Like I had to really pull myself. When 430 hits, I'm done. I can't say I'm going to do that extra because I was like, let me do this one last thing. Let me do this one last thing. That one last thing, it's now eight o'clock. And now I got to, you know, I don't have children, but I'm very involved with my nieces, you know, um, helping mentor them and different things like that. And it got to the point that I was kind of like missing them. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. So um, the calendar really helped, but I had to step aside and say, you know what, at 4.30 it's it. It's done. <laughs> that was really good. And I, I'm, I'm proud of you for doing that like so early because I know that people have tried, <laughs> right, to, to set those boundaries. And Tanya, I see you shaking your heads. So I want to bring you in on this one because even as an entrepreneur, I think our boundaries, we've extended our own boundaries, right? And, and yes. just messed up our own lives in some ways. Well, for me, you know, I'm an extrovert. I love people, right? And I'm like, Donna, this, this virtual world is nothing new. But I needed separation because my husband works downstairs, I work upstairs. And there was no, we don't have any, our kids are grown. So there was no separation. I can't get cute. I'm in spandex for over a year. You know, I, I went out, I mean, and this is so funny. I went somewhere and I, to a party, a virtual, well, it was half virtual and hybrid. So I decided I was going to get dressed up and put on some heels. When I went to the party, I was able. And I promise you guys, when I got back home on Saturday morning, well, Friday night, I was disabled because I had been out of shoes for over a year. So I say this to say this here, the fatigue is real. Um, I, you know, and I love people, but the meltdown because I want to get out. I want to see people. And like I tell people all the time, when this thing is open, it's going to be, when it's, when it's over, it's going to be like roaches coming out because we're going to party for the whole weekend. And that's just how it's going to be. But it has really impacted me because I lost boundaries because you can only watch, I'm not a movie buff. I can't sit still. So I find myself on the weekends, Friday nights, if I'm, you know, I'm working at three or four o'clock in the morning, it's becoming like a workaholic and it ain't fun. It don't feel good, you know? And so I made a conscious decision to be intentional about cutting it off. So I have two days that I work long hours. I will say that, right? Two Tuesdays and Thursdays, I work long hours. Friday, the day, 12 o'clock, I went in this, I went out and just had a good time, whatever, with the mask on. But it has been a struggle for me because I did, I think I was touched with a little bit of depression. Just touch, just a little bit. I'm real. Because I you can't see your friends, you know, your girlfriends, you can have your cocktails and all that kind of stuff. And work, I mean, I think COVID has shown us that it's more in life than work. And so the calendar is going to be helpful and then being intentional with mm -hmm. self-care. What about you, Tangela? How has this impacted you in, in boundary setting? As um, as you were speaking, what I was thinking about my issue right now is we now have seven, I have seven weekdays. So the week has gone from Monday to Sunday and it starts all over again. So it was happening and I didn't even realize it until recently that my Saturday was just like a Monday morning. I would get up and be at wherever it is I'm working, if it's at the t kitchen table, if it's in wherever, but my work day is just extended. So that's something that I know that I need to work on right now. Like to have, whether it's four, five, six, seven sunlight hours, you know, where I actually just don't do any work, don't do any schoolwork, just do things for me. So I think that for me, that has been the biggest, you know, without even realizing it, that had become my reality. And yeah. so that's something now I'm trying to backtrack it and, and really work on. And I miss my friends too. You know, we'd go out, do dinner, you know, have a quick drink or whatever. Um, but it's just not something that I feel comfortable doing right now. You know, with as you know, hopefully, you know, I'll be old enough or young enough to get the vaccine soon. You know, so I'm hoping that I could be a little bit, not that I'll stop doing, a, you know, that I won't be cautious, mm -hmm. but I'll be able to do a little, I'll feel comfortable doing a few more things that I'm doing right now. Yeah. And in the comments, Donna said that, you know, um, COVID will change, has changed what I will and will not do when things open up. And I think that that's the same for a lot of people, right? There are things that we used to do just not even thinking about it, that when we do get to go back outside and 
be amongst the people. <laughs> we will we will think about those things, right? How close we are to people, how, you know, the places in which you are and just being confined. So Tanya, since you brought this, um, oh, Donna said she means what she can be hired for. So um, Tanya, you brought this up. So what has, how has it impacted you in terms of boundaries between work and life and your personal life? Um, yes, I did bring this up. I, I think for me, honestly, uh, my biggest issue with working at home because of COVID is that I've lost my sanctuary. My home was my sanctuary. And so what I had to do, and I was deliberate about it, was to find a place um, where I could work. Um, and my place, unfortunately, is my dining table. And so while my son is in his room working, I'm at the table and he sees me at the table, he knows I am working. Um, and so I try to limit my work to this area. And again, I mean, as I stated earlier, unfortunately, it doesn't stop your mind from working, but the actual physical work stops once I get up from the table. Um, so, so that has been different for me, uh, because usually, honestly, I'd leave work a little bit earlier because I had a long trek home. Now I don't have the ride. So I am grateful for that. So there are definite things about COVID that I'm grateful for. It has given me opportunities to spend more time with my son. And so for that, I am truly grateful and blessed. But at the same time, I miss having the sanctuary that I found in my home. Um, Cause even now my bedroom is just not enough. It's like from the moment now I'm in, I'm like, oh my God. So now I need to actually get out. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things I did like about my home. Yes. So, and that's how it has changed um, boundaries. Like I said, the boundaries are set. I'm sitting here, honey. Like right now, my son knows, don't come outside, mommy's <laughs> on a video, you know, and so he knows that, you know, and so that's basically um, the boundaries that we've set, that I set, at least. And that was so well said, Tanya, because I, I think, you know, when you say about your home being your sanctuary, when people when you're working in an office environment, so it's a little different from entrepreneurs who work in their home all the time, um, but when you when the for people who worked in the office environment right and when march came and they were like nope go home <laughs> right and now that becomes your work and you have to be on things like this right they have to be on zoom and people want you to be on camera when before if i didn't want you to see inside my house or know how i live or do any of that i didn't have to let you do that right so it really did expose people and and bring people into spaces that were really your sanctuary your privacy your your haven right and so you know and and it did give you give a lot of people an opportunity to spend more time with their children so it's kind of this COVID has been you know good and bad right um horrible for some and but in terms of the workplace it has shown employers that you can have people work at home, right? So all this stuff about, no, you can't, no, we can't do it that way, you can. But it also has invaded spaces for people that I think is in a way that nobody really envisioned because we didn't think it was going to last this long. So I want to switch up the conversation a little bit and talk about self-worth, right? So as women... We, we talk a lot about our worth, our value, um, you know, self-confidence, self-sabotage, all of those different types of things. So when you hear self-worth, Becca, what does that mean to you? Um, that is, I laughed, I laughed when you said that because I struggle with it, you know, identifying how, um, how to value myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it shows up in my business because it's, you know, valuing the service that you provide. And I'm, a I'm an attorney, you know, I went to school for a really long time to learn the things that I did and I've practiced for a long time. And how do you, how do you, I, how do you give a value to that? Um, but self-worth, I mean, I guess in the general sense is, I don't know, like, do you like yourself? I guess really what do you like yourself? I don't know. Yes, yes, I do. Um, and for some people it's really hard to get there. Mm 
Yep. Miss Diani, what do you think? Like, what does self-worth mean to you? So, so when I think of self-worth, I think of, what do I think of Diani, right? It's like doing that internal audit. Like, who is Diani? Um, how is Diani feeling today? Um, I also think more of like my self-esteem, right? Because based on my self-esteem, it means I'll think highly or or low, super low about my self-worth. So I think my self-worth is going to be based on value that I give to Diani. Um, and how do I protect my self-worth? How do I communicate my self-worth? And I think I can only do that if I if I place a high self-worth on Diani, then anybody I bring into to Diani's atmosphere will place the same on me. It's like looking in the mirror, right? So when I think of self-worth, I'm going to say, what is that value that I'm placing on me, my time, my, my expertise, even quoting some Donna St. Louis, because, you know, I, I drink everything she feeds me. Um, so so that's that's what I would say, Kelly. Um, yeah. And I, Donna, for self-worth, like how does that, it, it, whether we have high self-worth or low or maybe somewhere in the middle, how does that translate into how we show up, right? As professionals in our workplaces, if we're working for someone or in our business as an entrepreneur. So, you know, it's so funny that this come, came up because I just had a conversation with the CEO that I, that I was coaching today. And one of the things that I teach is value-based selling within organizations. And we've heard value-based selling a thousand times, but then what happens is they give you a quota and they look at the bottom line. And, and so I'm coaching value-based selling and this is how I explained it to them. Um, so I said, you guys, there are only three companies that can get these type of coaching spot, spots per six months. I said, and in August, when yours is done, someone else will take that spot. And he said, well, hold up now. <laughs> we don't know that we want to let go of our spot. You know, what do we have to do to keep our spot? And I said, you have to make it worth my time. Notice that I did not say worth my money. I said worth my time. You cannot pay me to waste my time. You can't give me enough money to get up on Tuesday morning and coach y'all for three hours for eight weeks and then coach y'all for six months if you're not going to use it. You're wasting my time, but I know that my time is more valuable than dollars. And so what you really have to ask yourself is what is important to you? So my language of love is quality time. So therefore, I look at time. But if appreciation is important to you, then you need to say how... I can't pay you enough to not appreciate, right? Whatever that is will help you identify your value. It's one of the reasons why even when I'm teaching sales and I'm gonna tell everybody this, treat your time, treat yourself like it is a private club and not everybody can get in. Take people through the gauntlet of disqualification. You do not deserve space in my space. And the people who get in, I cherish them. Diani, Rebecca, everybody on here, everybody else that might say whatever, 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 whatever. Listen, they can come and talk to these ladies. They're like, well, clearly you don't know her. And that's probably why you're not in the space. You have to treat your space like your private club. That is your value. But you got to know what your value is. Mine is my time. You can't pay me to waste my time. Yeah. And Tanj, you had something that you wanted to chime in on this. I was just going to add, you know, it's about that self-talk. What do you tell yourself about every aspect in your life? And Donna just gave you her mantra and it makes sense, right? If you value your time, there's no amount of money. It's, if you're going to use the information that I gave you, as I know you're going to use it, we can work together. And that works for Donna, right? And it works for a lot of other people too, because that's why you're so busy. Yeah. And we teach people how to treat us. Yes, exactly. I can say that you definitely, and I appreciate what Donna said, that when you are working in my space, time. If you ain't going to get your head right and, and ready to do the work, then we can't spend no time together. It's just like almost a relationship, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, like one of the things that Donna was saying too, though, is we talk about self-worth and having people pay you what you're worth. People really can't pay you what you're worth because going back to what Becca said, you know, she's had all these years of, you know, going to school as a lawyer, all the things that are in her head. So, you know, we have to think about 
what are the things that, going back to what Donna said, that we value, right? And that we're willing to exchange, right? For, for you to be in the space, to take up our space. And, you know, often we, we think that we're, if we're in a new space or we're trying out, we're trying to do something new. So for example, moving from employee to entrepreneur, we think that there is less value in us doing that because we have now stepped into a new space as opposed to appreciating that we take everything of who we are into those new spaces. And Donna, you mentioned this and, and, and I don't want to just kind of skip over this in terms of having people, not everybody belongs in your space, right? And so many of us are, are entrepreneurs and there will be entrepreneurs who are listening to this. And I think one of the things that women, um, so we, we're nurturers, right? And so oftentimes when we're in business, we say yes to clients that we should not say yes to. So talk to us about that and why not every client is a good client, right? And so not every client is going to help move our business or our life or our career forward. Yeah, there's, there's actually two ways that I say this. So a lot of times we'll, we'll meet up with a client and we'll say, um, we want to put their logo, especially if they're a big client, we want to put their logo on, on uh, our website. And I always say this, I'm like, do you want your face on the website? Because if you don't, you might not want to work with them. That's number one, right? Because I don't want my face on everybody's website. Number two, when I say treat it like a private club, so I'm going to use the mansion retreat. It literally has 13 rooms that people can buy. So I am super funky about who gets in there because if somebody gets in there who won't do the work, then they can go out and spread that my product doesn't work. And y'all know I'm funky about people getting their return on investment. So I need to make sure that when I say treat your business like a private club, start treating your business like that. And you will be surprised when you stop chasing the dollar, the clients will chase you. It really is a game changer. Yeah. And Deanne, I want to go to you for a second because um, we're talking about knowing our worth, right? And then asking for it. But that's scary for some people. So what are some of the tips that you could give to the women who are listening about negotiating? So negotiating salaries or negotiating their rates, what would you say? I think it, it goes back to know your worth, right? And and I, for one, um, in, in my firm, or, or I don't negotiate prices. I literally do not negotiate. Um, and I'll tell you in a minute, maybe this is not the firm for you. And um, I, I love what Donna was saying about being the private club because I had to slowly come to that realization because I thought I wanted to work with everybody. Oh my God, I would feel bad. You can't afford me. Let me give you a 25% discount to fit you into, into where you need to be. And I, I can proudly say, I'll, I'll tell you my price. And if you cannot afford it, that's okay. Maybe we're not the business for you. When it comes to negotiating, whether it's rates or anything of that sort, I would say once you know your worth, for example, I spend a lot of time, Kelly, and to the woman listening, learning immigration law. Like I'll read every case. I, I read the Biden bill. I spend hours reading what it means. Because of that, I know my, my value. I know where my expertise lies. I am not just gonna fly by the, the, the seat of my pants when I'm talking about immigration law. You know, I'll get off the, 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 this conference tonight and I'll go see what's the latest, what's the greatest. And because I, 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 I'm always leveling up who I am as an attorney, I have a lot of confidence when I say you're going to pay me X for this. I invest a lot of time and money into me, into my craft, into my business. So that gives me the confidence to be able to say as a woman, as a woman entrepreneur, this is what my value is. This is what I'm pricing it as. And we're not going to have this back and forth about the yams and bananas and potatoes. It's not, it's not going to happen, um, not with my practice, not with, any, with anything that I do. So once you know your self-worth, you work on your craft, those things will allow you to become more confident in determining what your, what, what your worth is if you're putting a dollar sign next to it. I want to bring Tanya into this conversation. So Tanya, so Diani's talking about it from the perspective of being an entrepreneur. 
in the workplace, right? So a little different where you have to negotiate salaries. Sometimes the underlying thing is the same, but there are some nuances when you're in, um, when you're an employee as opposed to an entrepreneur. So what are your thoughts around how to help women negotiate for you know higher salaries or negotiate for a bonus or whatever negotiate the next thing i think kelly must be talking about tanya morris because (laughs) because this tanya while she does know her worth and so you'll find that i'm not answering your question um (laughs) While I do know my worth, sometimes it's not about knowing your worth. And so for me, I know my worth. I'm also around individuals and I see people all the time who I'm sure they know their worth, but because of their circumstance, they have to settle for maybe less than they could. Because right now we're talking about it seems as though we're talking about entrepreneurs, but not everybody is an entrepreneur. No, I'm talking about that's why I wanted to bring you in. But not not just because for me, yes, I I was an entrepreneur, but even as an entrepreneur, Kellen, you must remember this. I had my own practice for seven years, but one of the most difficult thing for me, yes, I had the experience. Yes, you were going to get an amazing attorney who would work hard for you, but I always considered my client. And until I was in a position to hire somebody else to talk money, please. I was shortchanging myself all the time because I was in my head, I was thinking, my gosh, if I don't have that money, how the heck do I expect them to have that to pay me? So that's one scenario. But I'm also thinking about um, individuals who, you know, they may not be working in a law firm, they may be working, you know, and I don't want to put an actually name a business out there. But you know, you have to take whatever job you can get to simply provide for your family. And it has nothing to do with you not knowing what your worth is. You just have prioritized your family before anything else. And then you hope someday you'll be able to get that job or have that opportunity where you're able to get what you're actually worth if we're talking about a dollar value. Right. So, you know, so basically it's, it's, I think what it comes down to for me, it's what are you willing to, to, to sacrifice for, for whatever it is that you're doing. So for me, for example, I know my worth, but right now I work for the state of Florida. Now I understand with 24 years experience, I could be in a law firm and I could be making way more money, but for me, it was more important to have the flexibility to spend time with my family, with my child, especially at this point and stage in his life. So it's a matter again of what's important for you. And for me, my worth and my priority was being a mother above everything else. Right, and I understand all of that. So, and and I understand that people have to make sacrifices. What I'm trying to, to give to the women who are watching is that when we're in these spaces, right, and we have to negotiate. So whether we're working, you know, at Walmart or we're working in a law firm or we're working for the government or we're working for ourselves, we all negotiate, we have to negotiate. Right. So at some point, there's some negotiation that's going on. So what I want to do is to give them the skills. Like, what are some of the tips that we can give to them to say, listen, when you are, for example, if if somebody asked me, I would say if I'm an employee and I'm going to, you know, I want a raise. Right. I will tell somebody to make up to have a resume, right? An in-job resume. So we all have our resumes where we tell all the jobs that we've had, but while you're working, make sure that you're writing down all the things that you've been doing, all the things that you've accomplished. What have the outcomes been? How have they impacted the organization? Because then for somebody who may not, you know, be as comfortable asking for a certain amount of money, you, and, and if you decide I'm going to ask for this amount of money and somebody says, well, why should I pay you that? Mm-hmm. And you say, well, here, I have done all of those things. So that's something that I would tell somebody to create this in in job resume. So I'm going to go to Tanya and then uh, have Diani jump okay, in. Okay, so my HR head is coming on. So what I have yeah. seen and I would recommend for those who are working, I'm going to do two part entrepreneur, but the ones that are working, just like you said, their resume, but the performance evaluation is a good tool. 
-hmm. to um, leverage and also how you brought value to the organization. So I will write up a statement about how I have provided value to you and support it with a performance evaluation, and then probably have some competitive analysis on the salary for that particular position. So when I was in HR, I would get people, especially IT, white men would do it all the time, right? They will go and get some off a glass door and get this, this, this job title and put this stuff on hand and say, you're not paying me what I'm, you know, what I'm worth. Just because they did that, they got the money. You know what? I tried to do that. I didn't get the money, you know? So what I'm telling you, what one of the things you should do is do that to leverage yourself, do the research. Now for an entrepreneur, I will say one of the biggest things I had to learn is mindset, my money backstory. How did I view money and my mindset? And I connected that to my worth, which is my time, but mindset about money. There are so many entrepreneurs, their money story is jacked up. They don't believe they deserve it. They should have it and all this kind of stuff. It's too much or whatever. But once you um, determine, get that mindset straight up around money and your money story, then now you can, uh, and I know Tanya said, it's not always about the money. And I get that. I've been there when I worked for the state of Georgia. But at some point when you become an entrepreneur, you got to put a value on it. And time, like Donna said, is so important to me, but it's come from mindset for me. So that's Ms. what I would recommend. Thank you, Tanya. Miss Diana, you wanted to jump in. Yes, and and I won't repeat some of what Ta Tonya Morris. Um, I won't repeat what she said because I was going to add that to about the mindset piece, and she was hitting all the points I was going to make. So I wanted to take my entrepreneur hat off, Tanya, and to the woman in the audience. Um, years ago, I got recruited to work for one of the largest law schools in the nation. And um, when they asked me what I wanted to make, I ripped out a sticky note, thought about what I wanted to make, then doubled it, wrote it on the sticky note, and I got moved to Florida, right? Um, so one of my jobs, Tanya, was recruiting faculty. So I had to staff an entire law school. And here's this little black girl amongst all these white men and everybody came in. So I'm looking at the white men and I'm looking at the black woman or the white woman that came through the door. And I looked at how they negotiated. We had white males who had barely, barely started practicing, asking for $300,000. We had talented, badass black women in Tampa practicing for many years, asking for $80,000. I wanted to send them a message like, girl, you crazy? You know, you know, they want you, you know, you know, we have a diversity problem. The black woman consistently as talented as they were. And the black woman who negotiated the best in Tampa became my best friend because I've never seen anything like it. She walked in like a badass, no suit. She wasn't even trying to show she was a lawyer. She was like, they gotta pay me to come here. So I wanted to say to the woman in the audience, stop undercutting yourself, right? It doesn't have to be money, it can be time. By the time I left that job, I think I had about two months in vacation time because I made it known that I, I travel a lot and this job is not gonna mess up my traveling. So for my woman in the audience, whether you're working for the state, when I went to work for the State Bar of Michigan, straight out of law school, hasn't even passed the bar exam, I did what Tonya recommended. I went on Glassdoor, did a whole research and said, you're not paying me enough. They ended up hiring a company to research whether they were paying me enough or not. And mind you, I'm, it's my first year out of law school. I couldn't even pass a bar. I kept failing the darn bar, but I knew what I was bringing to the table, right? And they hired a whole firm to do an investigation on whether they were paying me because I was their worst nightmare. I'm a young black woman who they've put in a corner office and they were underpaying me, right? So woman, if you're listening, you got to negotiate those rates or time if you want to spend time with your family, if that's important to you, vacation time, um, money's dumped into your 401k. Are you going to match that 50%? There's so much more you can negotiate as opposed to, 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 um, to money. Even the last firm that recruited me, I wanted a 40% origination fee. 
I worked my tail off bringing business in because it meant 40% more into my pocket. So these are things that we as women can do and you will scare them. They're going to, you're going to scare the crap out of them. They're either going to want you or they don't want you, which is a win-win. Right. Um, that's what I wanted to add. So I, I didn't want it to come off as just entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs. Right. And women, when you're working in these corporations, be a business within the corporation. That's right. Isolate yourself as a brand and a business. So they will want you. And when you walk out, somebody's going to hand you a sticky note and you're going to put your price on it. And it doesn't have to be dollar sign. Thanks, Kelly. You're welcome. And Becca, I saw that you right wanted, in. hold on, Tonya. Okay. Becca, I saw that you wanted to jump in. Just a, a practical tip. Um, I call it the barf factor. Um, what num right? T Tangie's, Tangie's looks like she's going to barf, but it's the barf factor. Like what is that? What is that number that just makes you sick? Like you can't imagine saying these numbers out loud. Diani touched on it. Like when she was talking about her clients who cannot afford her, the barf factor is I'm, I'm trying to say, okay, well maybe, maybe my client's not going to pay me because they can't afford this number, but you know what? It doesn't, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because they're not your client. They're somebody else's client. Um, but to get over the barf factor, and I'm learning this, I'm like practicing this on a daily basis. I practiced it this afternoon with, I, when I quoted a very large fee is you say the number out loud and you practice saying the number out loud until you don't barf in your mouth. And I know it's, you know, it's kind of gross to think about it that way, but like, that's how it is to me when I'm talking about valuing the services that I provide is that it's scary the easiest way to describe it is like, oh, I'm going to be sick saying it. How can I minimize it so that I don't stutter when I say my number so I am more confident in the way that I say it? Did I stutter when I said my price? No. And you practice it. That's it. I'm All Rebecca. Right, I'm Ms. done. Rebecca. All right. So we're going to move on to a different topic. So I want to know, what have you women, so I know you're all badasses, but how have you gotten in your own way at some point in your career, whether it's in entrepreneurship for your business or just in your career. Donna can't wait to share with us. And then we're going to go to Teresa. Sorry, I could not help it. <laughs> I'm actually gonna, I'm going to share two stories because this is something that I've seen that has happened to me and then that I accepted it and then I corrected it. So the acceptance was that I considered myself to be inadequate. 100% doesn't matter how much I know I was less than always believed it in, in regards to whatever I was going after. I, there was something that I didn't know. I, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't high enough. I didn't have 120% of what they were asking for. And so I said, I need to find someone else that I could put in that spot because clearly it shouldn't be me. Okay, so let me tell you what had happened. And Kelly knows about this because this happened not long ago. And Rebecca and everybody's probably heard me talk about it. So I had this huge company that wanted to hire me to come in and coach salespeople. And I said, I'm gonna see if I can find somebody for you. And I'll be very specific. I'm gonna go see if I can find a white guy to hook you up. And so, and so, and my coach was like, have you lost your mind? Who by the way is a white guy. And he said, have you lost your mind? He goes, you don't do sales training or sales coaching. You create a sales movement. He goes, I've seen you turn around complete organizations. Have you lost your mind? So I call this the Warriors Prosperity Cycle. I thought I was inadequate. I leaned into it, picked up the phone and said, I think I'm inadequate. Why do you think I'm adequate? Gave me step by step by step by step on why I wasn't inadequate. Went for it scared anyway. Closed a six-figure deal with that client turned around. And by the way, I was going against the Grant Cardone's, the Mark Wayshacks, the Sandler Institute. These are huge with staff and people. And then there is me and one and one. And then even just now they, and I was just telling Kelly this the other day, that client recently said, um, yeah, we're going to need to go ahead and extend this contract and double this contract. And we need you to do more. 
it just happened. This is something that I would have walked away from because in my mind, I believed that I was inadequate. I didn't have imposter syndrome. I had a moment of doubt. You're welcome, Kels. I had a moment of doubt. (laughs) I had a moment of doubt. And I had people who helped me find the correction. And people always say, oh, you were so confident. No, I was scared as hell. But I did it. Did it anyway. anyway. And that has turned into almost $200,000 in business. And I'm not talking about something that happened eight years ago or nine years ago. This was in July of last year. Just so y'all know. So I don't want y'all to be like, oh, but girl, you have sold $250 million. No, this was in, this this was recently. So I just want y'all to recognize that the thing and what I thought last thing, what I thought was this. I thought these people that I'm competing against, they're giants. They are like, if you looked at them on TV, they're like six foot eight, 250 pounds. And you're like, oh my God, I'm going up against them. And then you see them in real life and you're like, oh, you're short. You're like, what, five, two? Like just, <laughs> just, they're not as big as bad and bad as you're thinking about. Turns out I'm the damn giant. They need to get, catch up. Yeah. I'm sorry. I had, that's why I had to do that. Cause no, I've that's been all right. Um, I, I love that story because it, it is the thing that we, you know, y'all know I call it the audacity of mediocrity, right? That they will show up regardless and we we hold ourselves back. So who else um, would like to share on that? Um, Teresa. Oh, okay. I think Teresa wanted to share something. I was just going to say, like, for me, um, I would say a fear of what people thought. And I'm, I'm going to kind of go into it. So I come from a family, my parents, um, they were, you know, they dropped out of school. So we were taught to, you know, you go to school, you graduate, you get a job. So four years ago when I said, hey, I'm going to, you know, do, you know, my jewelry business, I got the, it's not going to work, it, you can't do it. And a part of me was like, I can do anything. I'm going to do it. So I got in it and I grind. But I think a lot of times, but before that, like um, Donna was saying, I was scared because of what people were saying. So I had to get out of my own fear, get out of my own way and like, no, I can do it. So um, I want to shout all of you ladies out because I have watched you and ladies who leverage. So this is like Kelly. Kelly, I tell you, I'm very quiet. Um, I listen a lot. So I am taking a lot of nuggets. And when I tell you, you ladies are just so badass. I am just honored to be on this panel with you guys because I'm learning a lot. But um, but yes, that's all I'm going to say. And I'm Teresa and I'm done speaking. And I love that <laughs> Teresa um, has just really gotten out of her own way to speak, right? And to speak up and to show up because um, we silence ourselves sometimes, right? So when we're talking about getting in our own way, that's one of the things that we do to silence ourselves. So, Diani, did you raise your hand? Just two seconds. To okay. add that. Like, I'm the opposite, right? I commit to stuff, then I'll call Kelly and Donna scared. Like, I'll sell shit online, excuse my French. And then I'm like, Donna, what am I selling? Um, <laughs> I, I just said, yes, I've sold. I'm like, Kelly, I'm doing media. Like, what do I say? Right. And so I'm here I, for it. I'm just saying, I'm here to help you do that. I am the opposite. Like, I, I really think, <laughs> like, when you talk about somebody whose head is, like, sometimes too big for their bodies, that that's me. So it's the opposite. But it's you can have the same problem where you're biting off more. You know, I've literally had to, Donna, put me on your ca- calendar. I, I'm selling a six-week incubator. And, and she's like, what do you want to hear from me? I'm like, I don't know what it is. Um, I, I have an idea. And, and so it's the opposite, which can be just, I think Donna or Kelly can be um, a, as as devastating, right? So, yeah. yeah. But, so but I, I do want to... people to do that though, Dion. Yeah. I do tell people, I'm like, don't, Kelly's heard me say it a thousand times. You don't have to have it built. You don't have to have it perfect. You have to sell it first and then build, and then it. build it. Don't yeah. go build it and talk about if I build it, they will come. No, they won't. <laughs> I tried that. (laughs) You need to sell it, right? You need to sell it and then build. So going off of what Diani just said, so Diani really does. So Diani for me is, she's an unbelievable person, right? In terms of, in terms of whatever you teach her, 
whatever information you give her. I did a, 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 a thing in, <laughs> she has her notebooks, but I did a live in our Facebook group one day and I was talking about listen, learn, implement, right? And it was the fact that all of us now spend, a, most of us spend a lot of time in Clubhouse. We spend a lot of time when the world was opened up, going to conferences and doing all those things. And we listen, we learn, we write it down in our book, and that's it, right? We're all excited. Diani is the total opposite. She listens, she learns, and before she's done talking to you, she's already implementing. So for the rest of you, I want to know, and, and she will ask for help, right? She will call, she will text, she will, who, I am not good at asking for help. Who, how do you all, do you all ask for help? Like how, how are you with that? Tanj, I see you're coming off. No, I was going to say, I have a really, really hard time asking for help, mm -hmm. but I think that's one of the things that Ladies with Leverage has helped me with, you know, even to the point of, you know, if there's something that comes up, like I needed help with, and I'll, I'll shout out Lisa Carper, you know, I needed help with a school asked me to do a virtual visit, but they wanted it recorded. And immediately, you know, I reached out to Lisa and she stepped right in and we're doing some things, you know, together because of that. So I've learned, what is it? A closed mouth doesn't get fed, right? So it, it's hard to do at times, but I think part of that goes back to your that whole self-talk thing again. Because just like I can ask for help and I need someone to help me, I'm also a resource. Mm -hmm. That there are things that I can do for other people in the group. And I think that that's like one of the biggest things from LWL that I, I take away. And I take away a lot. <laughs> the other thing I just want to say too, um, Diani, that there are so many things that we're given that the hard part can be what to implement first and not forgetting something because yeah. there's so many good ideas and you're, you're learning from watching other people do things. Because Tressa, for example, you know, we've watched you as well. And, you know, you're doing amazing things to get on lives as much as you do and do your jewelry. I mean, um, that takes a lot. That takes a lot. And sometimes I think we have to step outside of our comfort zone to see ourselves. Yeah. Because there are things that I used to love doing, right, that I had gotten away from and taking that step. Now it's all coming back to me like, wait a minute, I love doing this. Why, why did I stop doing those things? So I just want to thank everyone for pushing me and allowing me to then give back and help wherever I can. Tonya, did you want to jump in on this one? No, I think they answered the question. Okay. I really do. I think sometimes we just get in our way. My biggest thing when I transition out of the workforce to entrepreneurship, my biggest thing was mindset and then investing. Because, you know, when you work for somebody, they pay the bills. So until I got my coach, I had to learn those two things. And you are always shifting your mind when you mm -hmm. go to the different level. You always. Yeah. But investment in yourself was so huge. So I learned to to adopt that and I don't have a problem with ever investing. Yeah. Tanya, did you want Tanya Williams, were you did you want to say something about asking for help or actually I, I loved what Tangela said um about stepping um out of your comfort zone and actually almost stepping back and seeing yourself, maybe seeing yourself through other people's eyes, because I think when you do, um, I guess it's easier to, you have a better self-worth for one, but it's also easier to ask for what you, what you need. And for me, yes, I do have a difficult time asking for help. Um, I'm not sure. I think part of it is Maybe I don't trust anybody to do it as well as me. I, I'm just me. being honest. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I'm just being real. And so I, I'll spend that, waste that time doing the research and figuring it out for myself. And then another part of it is almost, um, I'll show you, you know, that mm -hmm. I can do this. So it, it's a mix of things for me, um, why I don't do that. But again, I appreciate what Tangela said you know, stepping out and, you know, looking at myself, especially when it comes to asking for what you're worth, um, I, I think. And as for asking for help, I think a big part of it is just pride. Yeah. Here's a question. I'm going to ask you all some pointed questions right now as we come down to the end. So I'm going to pick some people. So Becca, how can women make their mark in the workplace? Ooh. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the best one to ask this question because I've always been the one to cause the problems. Um, and but I don't, that might be making your mark. I don't mean causing the problems to 
you know, to cause problems to cause problems is that I always asked questions and challenged what I was being told, um, especially when it was, I, it, this is how we do it and, and don't ask questions. Um, I never, I can't think of a single job and I've been working since I was, you know, 14. I can't think of a single job where I just set, rolled over and said, okay, that's exactly how we're going to do it. Um, don't be afraid to ask the questions and don't be afraid to change things or break things. Right. And that is making your mark, right? So that's not a negative. So when you're saying I'm not the right person to ask, some of those things we have to reframe in our minds. No, you are the right person to ask because you are a person who has made your mark. And your mark is that if I come here, don't think I'm just going to just lay down and take whatever you, you know, you tell me. So that is making your mark. So I just want you to think about that and reframe that in your mind as we go forward because you are a badass um Teresa is Teresa frozen Teresa's frozen Teresa can you hear us yeah I can hear you can you hear me yeah we can hear you so how can a woman make their mark in the workplace um I would say just like like we kind of already said like know your word um, I work for a company when I first started there, you know, 24 years ago, I was the quiet one, but I had to learn to speak up in those meetings. Um, I remember one of my mentors that were there at the time in that, um, that office, she says, T, you bring a lot of value. I hear you when you're talking to your teams, you need to speak up more. So I would definitely say when you're in those settings, show them your value what you bring to the table and don't be afraid to speak up. Tonya, what do you think? Tonya Morris. <laughs> I forget we have Tonya and Tonya. So we're talking about in the workplace? Yes. Or just in well, your workplace could be entrepreneurship or it could be that you work in a corporation. I want to speak from the entrepreneur standpoint because that's what I love. I, I just believe you need to do you. Mm -hmm. I, I just believe it's oftentimes we look at, look to the left and look to the right. And I have found when I stay focused, I can have the best impact and I can be the best version of Tanya. When I start looking at what somebody else is doing and, and going to what Donna was saying, some of these people we think so big and they really small. And I, I'm just going to leave your gift will make room for you. So that's why I think you need to do you. Yeah. And comparison is a thief of joy. Yes, so. it is. <laughs> Dion, I'm going to ask you a different question. What is one thing you now know about being a woman and work? that you wish you had known earlier in your career? That I deserve to be where I am. Mm. I think in the very early stages of, and, and mind you guys, let me tell you, I've, I haven't applied for a job in over two, maybe close to two decades. Um, they've always found me and I always thought it's because I'm Jamaican, it's because I'm black. I never thought in the beginning I was smart or talented enough. I just thought, I was there to fit the quota. I wish I could look back and tell her, girl, you you belong here and you're, you're here because of your talent and your skills. Even when the large firms came knocking, I thought it was because I'm Jamaican or because I'm black. Mm -hmm. They wanted to fit their quota. I, I, I deserve, I so deserve every single opportunity that I've had. I've earned it and I've worked my tail off. So so that's to answer your question, Kelly. Thank you. And Donna, same question for you. Can you ask it one more time? Sure. What is one thing that you know now about being a woman and work that you wish you had known earlier in your career? I thought that's what you said. Okay, so to me, when I first started working, I had... Um, I had long blonde straight hair that I used to wear up in a bun and I wore pearls and I wore tan, no, no beige suits because I was, I mean, I was literally beige from head to toe. I was trying to hide and fit in and find the crevice that I could fit. What I wish I knew was that the room needs to expand with my entry and contract with my departure. What? I say it again, not... say it again, say it again, say it again, <laughs> rewind, say it again. The room needs to expand with my entry and contract with my departure. I need to be a force and not a fit in. And that is okay. Absolutely. Tanj, what about you? What Diani said, 
what Donna said. <laughs> I don't think there's too much left other than the only other thing I can say is never lose sight of what it is that you love to do. And that might change from the beginning of your career to the middle of your career to the end of your career. But if you're always searching for and refining that, I think that all those other things we talk about, the room will, what was it, Donna, expand, contract, all of that will happen. Expand with your entry and contract <laughs> with your exit because you are a force. You are not meant to finish. All, all of that will happen, but you, it has to be in, it has to be in your heart. It has to be what you want to do. And the gift and room, all of that, ladies, all of it. All right, so I'm going to do a round robin with the last two questions. So you got to go quick because we, we don't have a lot of time. So first question, what is the best piece of career advice you've ever received? Tanch, you go first. The best piece of career advice I've ever received was save money. All Plan right. For retirement, that was the best piece. Okay, Tonya. Don't fit in. Diani. Don't fit in. Teresa. Save money. Tanya. Love what you do and then it's not, you, you won't consider it work. Donna. Whatever they're asking, for, whatever they're offering, ask for 10% more. <laughs> Rebecca, you know it's all about money. Rebecca, that's why I love her as my coach. Rebecca. Uh, you have to network. So my best, the best piece of advice I ever received was a boss who told me to suck it up. Mm. That was the absolute best piece of advice I ever received. It made me the brilliant attorney that I am. So sometimes we hear stuff. Now, I, I didn't think it was cute when he told it to me. I didn't think it was the best piece of advice that day. <laughs> but, but it turned out to be the best piece of advice I've ever received. So... The last thing that I want to talk about, um, you all know that I have a mission to empower young women and girls and that that is part of lady who leverages, ladies who leverage, that's part of our mission. And so what advice would you give to young women who are just starting their work journey? And I know we, we said what the best piece of advice was that we gave, and it might be the same thing that you tell, but if you were to think of, you know, young girls and young women who are really embarking on life and their journey, what is that thing that you would tell them? I'll start with you, Rebecca. Um, that your female coworkers and colleagues are not the competition. Mm, I like that one. Donna. Learn it, implement it, and if you want to master it, teach it. Wow. Okay. Tanya. Morris or um, Williams. William, sorry. <laughs> I, I'll do better. <laughs> yes, for me, believe in yourself mm -hmm. and you can do anything that you set your mind to. Absolutely. Teresa. I would say, and I know this sounds very simple, be on time. Mm. When you're on time, you don't miss opportunities. Ms. Diani, don't decorate your office and don't feed the office. Okay. I didn't, yep. I had a boss who asked me, why don't you have your, um, I used to have all my plaques and everything under my desk in a box. He was like, why don't you put them up? I said, because they're easier to move in the box. <laughs> so and, when and I gotta let go, me, they, let me add Kelly. when I go, they go. I've, I've been fired three times and I've, you know, the first time I had to, you know, pack. Yeah, I mean, so after that, I learned my lesson. Look, next time you fire me, I'm grabbing my purse. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Miss Tanya, Morris. I think I would tell a young person to brand themselves and do not allow people to d dictate or determine who you are because there's so much stereotype going on. And, you know, I do a lot around millennials and multi generation. So come in the door with your own brand. Yep. And Tang, I would say find the person who is in the position that they want and learn from them. Yeah, That was one thing I wish I had known sooner, the whole idea of getting a coach and investing in myself. Yeah. And I would say that you belong everywhere you are, but you don't belong everywhere. So, I, you know, the ladies know that I say that all the time, but I want to thank you all. Y'all are so, y'all are so amazing. We all did an amazing job. So don't worry, you stood up to self-care last Friday. You're okay, you did okay. <laughs> 
But thank you everyone who has joined us, whether you've joined us on Facebook or you've joined us live. I don't think there were any questions in the chat and I didn't see any um, on Facebook. But if you do have questions for us, paste, um, post them under the Facebook Live and we'll be happy to come in and answer those questions for you. If you wanna meet these women, you want to hang out with these amazing women, if you want to learn, which is really important, learn from these women, join us in Ladies Who Leverage, our Facebook group. You can join us on Facebook in our Facebook group. You can also subscribe to the Ladies Who Leverage podcast and you'll hear some of them. Donna, um, her episode actually will be aired March 29th, I believe it is. So we talk about her journey. And Ladies Who Leverage is really about helping women to just build their brands, build their business, build their badassery. And you heard the women. In Ladies Who Leverage, we do not compete. We collabosource. And collabosource is our word for really networking and getting together and helping each other. And this is only part two. Y'all are getting some amazing information. We have part three, which is on the 19th, and we are going to be talking about women's empowerment and the audacity of bad assery right that is our thing in ladies who leverage we are badasses so we're going to talk about badassery and then on the 26th which will be our final um what's the tea series episode we are going to be talking about relationships ex expectations versus reality so we all have you know what we think it should be and then we know what it ends up looking like. So if you want to join us live in our, um, what I'll call in our studio, then you can go to the t.live and you can register. If you have any comments, if you've learned anything from tonight, I would love for you to comment, tell us what your takeaways are, and really to connect with us wherever you can connect with us on LinkedIn, all their names are right here. Tangela, Tanya, Diani, Teresa, Tanya, Donna, Rebecca, Kelly. Connect with all of us on LinkedIn and come join us. And ladies who leverage, and if you're on Clubhouse, join us Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays at 7.45 a.m. We walk, talk, and collab a source. This morning we were just laughing and joking and having a grand old time. They learned that I have tattoos all up and down my back, so you never know what you're going to learn when you come <laughs> hang out with us. And on Wednesdays, every Wednesday at 6 p.m., we also have a room in Clubhouse. So come and join us. I'm so glad that you joined us today. And ladies, again, thank you all so much for supporting all of my crazy dreams and my visions and being willing to hang out with me on a Friday. Thank you.